Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it is my pleasure to give you a warm welcome to uh, this uh, webinar by socialprotection.org, socialprotection.org, which uh, recently turned uh, three years old. So congratulations also to this uh, excellent platform. Today, uh, we're going to discuss uh, promoting inclusion through social protection. Uh, giving the results from the UN report on the World Social Situation uh, 2018. Uh, basically, um, what we're going to do here is um, to discuss the fact that uh, social protection access is very uneven and varies uh, very widely, not only between countries, but within countries, uh, between groups, individuals depending on their age gender disability or uh, migrant status race or ethnicity thus uh, we recognize that all around the world there are uh, great gaps in access and uh, the insufficient benefits and these uh, challenges the effectiveness of social protection to promote inclusion resilience and leave no, leave no one behind which is the big message behind the social uh, the um, sustainable development goals. We need to uh, thus understand the barriers that uh, the diverse groups uh, face in accessing social, social protection in order to increase coverage and uh, improve benefits and thus ensure that all segments of society are included and basically that we make progress towards universal social protection. All these uh, topics of discussion uh, derive from uh, a UN report. Basically, social protection has come of age. Uh, the World Social Situation Report by the United Nations Department of Economic Social Affairs is the main global report by the UN on the social situation. And for the first time, it has been devoted to social protection and social protection differently from the, uh, what happened with the Millennium Development Goals is now explicitly mentioned uh, in, uh, in, in, in the SDGs. Thus, uh, we will try uh, to address questions such as what role does social protection play in achieving the SDGs? Is social protection uh, an effective policy tool to promote inclusion and leave no one behind? And uh, who enjoys social protection and who does not? and how can social protection programs be designed and implemented to be sensitive to the needs of disadvantaged people. To do all of this, we have today two excellent uh, speakers. First of all, we have uh, as a presenter, uh, Marta Roig. Marta is uh, the chief of the Emerging Issues and Trends section at the Division for Inclusive Social Policy at the UNDESA. And uh, she leads the preparation of the World Social Situation uh, Report and has more than 20 years of experience in different uh, social uh, development issues. Uh, you, you can see more details uh, in the, in the uh, PowerPoint. And then, as the commentator, we have uh, another great speaker, and uh, uh, this is uh, Stephen Kidd uh, from Develop Development pa Pathways. Uh, today he joins us uh, from Uzbekistan, I understand. And uh, Stephen has over three decades of uh, experience in supporting strategies and the delivery, the effective delivery of social development and social protection in different regions of the world, Africa, Asia, uh, the Pacific, and Latin America. He's the CEO of uh, Development Pathways and uh, has led work also at DFID and uh, HealthAge International. Marta joins us from New York, Stephen from uh, Uzbekistan, and uh, myself, Simone Cecchini from the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean from uh, Santiago, Chile. So, uh, Without further ado, uh, I will give the floor uh, to Marta. But before doing so, I uh, invite uh, our attendees to uh, pay attention, consider themselves as part of the, this webinar, and thus 
they have the opportunity to make questions and comments which will be shared uh, to Marta and to Stephen uh, via uh, the chat and I will uh, bring them uh, up to them. So please use the chat bar uh, for this pur exchange purpose. And now Marta, please go ahead. You have the floor for about uh, 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Simone. Um, and let me join you in uh, wishing um, everyone good morning or good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, as Simone said, this, uh, what we are going to present today are the main findings of the report on the world social situation, which is the main UN flagship publication on social development issues. This is not, Simone also said that this is not a recurrent report on social protection. The report cover, uh, covers different issues um, every time it comes out, once every two years. Uh, we have focused on employment, on poverty, and more recently we have focused on inequalities, and uh, more specifically in the last two or three years on um, what's called horizontal inequalities or group-based inequalities. Um, so this report falls also into the topic of inequalities, probably. Um, so, oh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the, our report, what frames our report is obviously the 2030 Agenda, and specifically two of the targets included in the agenda. The first one is uh, target 1.3, which probably most of you know. Um, it is to implement nationally appropriate social protection systems and floors. And this is the important part for the report, by 2030, to achieve substantial coverage of the poor and vulnerable. The question is then, who are the poor and vulnerable? Um, clearly, they are not a fixed set of the population, a static group, but rather both poverty and vulnerability are um, conditions that anyone is at risk of experiencing through at some point in their or our lives right and this uh, seeing poverty and in, uh, poverty and vulnerability as conditions rather than uh, issues that affect a specific group of people has policy implications but at the same time there's another target in the agenda target 10.2 which calls attention to some characteristics that increase the risk of uh, exclusion and therefore the risk of poverty and uh, vulnerability and those are age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion and so on. So based on these two targets, the goal of our report, um, next slide please, is to assess the impact of social protection in promoting social exclusion, focusing on these characteristics. So we look specifically at children, youth, older persons, persons with disabilities, migrants, ethnic minorities, and indigenous peoples with gender and economic status as cross-cutting issues. The report devotes uh, one chapter to each of these social groups. We will not go through each of the social groups for this presentation. We will just give a few examples to illustrate the, the main points we are making on the basis of uh, um, one or another chapter. The first question for the seminar, as um, Simone said, is what role does social protection play in achieving the SDGs? This is not central to our report itself, but we will devote a couple of minutes, a couple of slides maybe, to talking about that. And then we will go to the other questions which Simone already uh, uh, listed. No? Is, is social protection addressing the disadvantages faced by disadvantaged social groups? Um, um, what are the obstacles to uh, effective coverage that uh, the group selected face and uh, what are the policy implications of this? Um, next slide, please. So, um, so on the impact of uh, social protection and the SDGs, the agenda itself explicitly recognizes the effect of social protection uh, on uh, reducing poverty. There are many estimates of the impact of social protection on reducing poverty in specific countries or regions. Here we just cite one estimate among many. Okay, you can see it on the screen. Just to mention here that most estimates of the impact of social protection on poverty only estimate uh, how many people escape poverty thanks uh, to social protection. 
but obviously the main role of social protection is to prevent poly, uh, to prevent poverty in the first place and this how many people do not fall into poverty thanks to social protection is rarely included in the estimates that are available okay um, but obviously social protection does not only have an impact on, on uh, goal one poverty but on other goals as well the impact on health is immediate since um, uh, since universal health coverage since health coverage in general is part of social protection systems um, social protection has an impact on education we review a lot of empirical evidence in the report showing how social protection transfers um, promote school enrollment and attendance and the effect of social protection on gender equality is also um, explicitly recognized on the agenda um, particularly in target 5.4 so uh, next slide social protection also has an impact on uh, on reducing inequalities there's an increasing body of research um, showing the impact of transfers on reducing inequalities obviously the the effect is larger in countries that have more comprehensive social protection systems but it's significant in all regions. In, in this graph, we show the impact of social protection on one indicator of income inequalities, the Gini coefficient. And just to give you an example, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, uh, the Gini coefficient is as, uh, it's estimated. The, the Gini coefficient is reduced by more than 20% thanks to social protection transfers. Uh, next slide, please. And those, all these effects are remarkable given that social protection coverage is still low. We all, we, most of you have probably seen the, um, the latest ILO figures, the latest ILO uh, social protection report, which shows that only 45% of the world population uh, is covered by at least one social protection scheme. Okay, so um, on to the next slide. We're talking about the obstacles faced by, uh, so that's the second question of the report. What, uh, what are the obstacles to effective coverage faced by the groups we look at? Uh, some of these obstacles are common to many groups. One of them is uh, uh, participation in informal employment. Youth, uh, members of ethnic minorities, uh, even women are overrepresented in informal employment and workers in informal employment are by and large not covered by social protection schemes, especially by contributory social protection scheme, schemes. Another obstacle is discrimination, which exists for many of these groups in many countries. Another one is location, where people live, especially living in remote areas and increasingly living in slums and disadvantaged areas of cities um, um, affects coverage. And the last one is a policy, the way in which policies are designed and implemented. Okay, uh, especially whether social protection schemes are contributory or tax financed, what's also known as non-contributory schemes, whether they are targeted or universal, whether they are conditional or non-conditional has an effect on access. Um, to give an example, so in the next slide. Um, an example are minimum contributory periods for unemployment insurance. Okay, almost all countries impose uh, minimum contributory periods for people to benefit from, uh, from unemployment um, insurance, right? In the OECD, for instance, on average, as you see on this graph, uh, workers have to contribute for at least 10 months before they can benefit from employment for unemployment insurance. This obviously plays against um, first-time job seekers who for the most part are young people who are also disproportionately affected by unemployment and therefore most in need of these benefits okay it also affects people with short um, working careers or segmented working careers another example is uh, oh next slide please um, so the tax tax financed um, or non-contributory social protection schemes obviously play a significant role in keeping people out of poverty. But when many of these tax finance schemes are means-tested, 
So they, they, uh, they are geared towards people with low incomes or living in poverty. And at the same time, especially in countries with high levels of informal employment, contributory schemes at our social insurance schemes are only available to people in the formal sector. So means tested, and by the way, Stephen Keith knows this graph very well because it's his, um, means tested tax finance schemes and uh, contributory pensions often leave a large coverage gap with, for people in the lower middle or middle of the income distribution. Okay, this graph shows the, the specific example of pensions. To name just one example, in the Philippines, uh, for instance, tax finance pensions cover about 35% of the population over 60 years old, while contributory social insurance schemes cover only uh, about 30% of the population. So there's about 40% of the population over 60 which is not covered by either tax finance or contributory schemes. In this, so on all these, our oh, next slide, please. On all these, expanding access to universal tax finance skills can, can help avoid some of the drawbacks um, and, and some of the drawbacks of uh, means tested scheme and ensure access to social protection by everyone. But even when um, social protection schemes are universal, some people are left out for several reasons. One is um, lack of access to um, lack of access to accessible information or lack of accessibility or registration methods that are complex. You know, the, the picture on the left of this slide shows uh, people lining up to access ATMs to withdraw transfers from um, social protection scheme, schemes. Okay, There's a long line. There's also the fact that some people fall, fall outside of the universe as defined by countries. Um, migrants in an irregular situation, for instance, are not part of uh, nationals, are not part of the universe as defined by the state, um, and therefore do not have access sometimes even to basic social protection floors. The picture on the right shows a young woman in a displacement camp in uh, Myanmar, in the Rakhine state of Myanmar. Um, this is an example of one instance where ethnic minorities have been denied or deprived of their citizenship. So the lack of citizenship, even for people who are born and who live in certain countries, deprives them of many other rights, including the right to social protection. Both examples illustrate that steps are needed to ensure that universal, even universal social protection schemes are available to everyone. So um, next slide. One question we tried to answer, one was question we had initially in the report was um, is social protection reducing inequalities across social groups? So not only addressing the disadvantages that some groups face, but beyond that, is it helping reduce inequalities? And here I have to say that given the data available, we were not able to answer this question systematically. There's some research done, for example, by the Commitment to Equity Initiative, showing that the sum of taxes and transfer space paid barely reduces income inequalities, for instance, across ethnic groups in some Latin American countries, okay? Members of ethnic minorities who live more often in poverty are receive more often transfers, but the transfers are often not sufficient to address gaps between these groups, which are too large for uh, social protection transfers alone, okay? Or the duration of benefits received is at times not sufficient to make a difference. Um, it, it has to be said that um, also regular mainstream programs don't always take into account group-specific characteristics. For, for instance, the costs are linked to having a disability are high and they are not uh, fully uh, covered by mainstream social protection schemes. So moving on to the next slide. Um, and focusing now on um, our policy recommendations, we structured our policy recommendations around three basic policy principles. The first one is availability, okay, uh, that is ensuring that programs are available at all uh, stages of the life cycle from childhood to old age. 
And one point we made here is obviously that to be inclusive and universal, uh, social protection systems cannot rely only exclusively on contributory schemes. There has to be a minimum set of tax financing schemes that should include universal child benefits, uh, universal old, um, old age pensions, disability benefits across the life cycle as well, and obviously healthcare. The second uh, main principle, if you can move to the next slide, is accessibility. And in the report, we promote what we call a universal social protection framework sensitive to difference. That is framework, frameworks that recognize that allowing all members of society to enjoy their rights calls for adapting uh, policies to the circumstances, the specific circumstances that people face. And here I have to say that even if in the report we focus on selected social groups, that doesn't mean that we promote uh, targeted or special measures as the main line of action, okay? We argue that universal measures are necessary, that special or targeted measures may be necessary, even if temporary, to help some groups overcome the challenges they face, but these targeted measures should not um, should not replace, should not, um, let's say, yeah, should not replace universal schemes, rather they should complement such schemes when they are necessary to address specific challenges that some groups of the population face. Um, and we also say that targeted group, targeted measures should not be approached as cost-saving measures. Uh, more, many times these uh, targeted measures are difficult to implement administratively and they have high costs. Um, and many times they suffer from significant errors of exclusion, okay? Still on accessibility, um, conditional cash transfers. The evidence on whether conditional cash transfers um, are more effective than non-conditional transfers instead of promoting human capital is at best inconclusive. So the question is here whether, and also they are administrative complex to implement, right? right? Because monitoring compliance is at times um, costly. So the question is here whether imposing conditions is the best way to promote inclusive social protection systems. Another issue is complex administrative uh, procedures which prevent people, and especially the people who need social protection the most from accessing social protection schemes, right? There are, and there are at the same time many examples, successful examples from countries that have simplified administrative procedures and have uh, succeeded in um, bringing more people, potential beneficiaries into social protection systems. Um, participation and consultation with beneficiaries is obviously uh, necessary to help address um, the obstacles they face. And feedback also is um, necessary there have to be official venues for people to denounce um, exclusion or corrupted um, social protection schemes. And then also information and communication systems tailored to each group of the population are also important to improve access. And the third and final condition is, uh, oh, and that's the next slide, sorry, is um, affordability. Uh, and we can move to yeah, adequacy, I'm sorry, adequacy. I've already mentioned that uh, social protection transfers are at times too low to make a difference, right? Or are too short in duration to make a difference. Um, here, obviously, uh, a fiscal commitment and, and policy, political will are required to make sure that social protection brings basic income security and adequate living standards for all. Um, there's evidence, uh, obviously, coming mainly from the ILO saying that social protection floors are um, affordable in most countries, though not all. Uh, and then, well, there's also the need, in fact, um, there's a balance that needs to be stricken between uh, um, adequacy or sufficiency and sustainability, especially as the um, world population grows older. Uh, countries will need to uh, balance uh, sufficiency and sustainability. And then a very final slide, just to say that and we can move to the next slide. Just to say that obviously social protection is an important um, um, policy tool, but just one tool among many to, uh, to promote social inclusion, right? Social protection obviously works best 
when uh, it is available with also universal and quality social um, services, for instance. And then one very final important to say that there is a general lack of data in social protection in preparing this report. We were unable to, uh, to assess whether uh, social protection, for instance, is making a difference in reducing inequalities across groups because many of the groups, some of the groups we look at are um, absent from official uh, censuses and surveys and so on. So there's a need to improve data in order to uh, assess whether social protection systems are being inclusive. inclusive. So with that, I thank everyone for your patience and I'll give the floor to Simone again. Excellent, Marta. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, very good presentation. I uh, want to say that it's already, we have already uh, 91 persons uh, attending the webinar. Uh, I just want to highlight, I think, one main point of, uh, of the presentation of the report, which is obviously social protection is key, as you said, to fight uh, poverty, to overcome poverty, but uh, obviously we also need to go beyond it and it has a very important contribution to lower inequalities. That probably is uh, well said uh, with the title of the report, Promoting Inclusion through social protection. You showed how social protection can have an impact, say, on uh, one dimension of inequality, which is uh, income or consumption equality as measured through uh, the Gini coefficient. This is very important, especially uh, for me to say, as uh, I, I live in uh, Latin America, which is one of the region with the uh, highest level of inequalities. And I also want to highlight a connected message that Social protection obviously needs to strive to be universal, but also consider those inequalities and thus be uh, sensible to difference. Also, another key point you have made is uh, of the barriers you talked about, the employment uh, barrier, and that goes to the origins of social protection, which was thought as uh, social protection for workers, while we are now thinking of social protection for the entire population. I also want to share with you uh, two comments that we have already received by uh, our attendees. One from an anonymous uh, attendee is on the uh, making a point about the fact that we need to bring social protection and also the SDGs to the municipal level, which is a point which is also always well taken because social policy, after all, means reaching everyone, every person. And uh, the second comment instead is from um, Muhammad Islam. And Muhammad basically uh, raises uh, different uh, points about the fact that uh, basically we need to treat uh, people who access these programs with respect. Right. So uh, he says that uh, um, no money should re be required. So making a comment on, on possible corruption cases, uh, no unethical favors and uh, people being uh, molested and also that there should be participation. I think the Mohammed comment basically raises the fact that we need to look at social protection as a, a right, a human right, and going beyond the concept of beneficiaries and thinking of, of citizens and persons. But um, I will stop here, and now uh, I have the pleasure to uh, give the floor to, to Stephen Kidd, who uh, has about uh, 15 minutes to uh, comment on uh, Marta's presentation. Stephen, please go ahead, you have the floor. Okay, thanks, Simone, and uh, thanks, Marta, for your uh, for your great presentation. And uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening to everybody who's who's listening. Um, I think you know, having read the report, I think I would highly recommend the report to to everybody. It gives a, a very good description of, of what social protection is. It gives very strong rationale for why countries should invest in social protection. It has a great overview of. Um, the different types of impacts that uh, um, social protection can have. It looks into issues around how best to 
uh, countries can reform their systems, have much more effective social protection systems. I particularly like the fact that the program, that the paper dedicates a whole chapter to the importance of um, uh, providing disability benefits for both children and adults with with disabilities, uh, uh, something that's very often forgotten about, despite the fact that uh, a relatively high proportion of the world's population have, have disabilities. And over 25% of uh, households internationally have somebody, uh, uh, have a household member that is uh, that has a disability. I think that the paper from the, the, the publication for me is, is great in that it's, uh, um, you know, it offers a, you know, it's very strong in, in promoting and, 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 and providing a rationale for, for an inclusive life cycle approach to, uh, to national social protection systems. And I think, I think without sort of um, saying it directly, implicitly, the paper takes a clear side in the big debate that we find internationally that's ongoing, particularly amongst international organizations on whether countries should follow a kind of poor relief approach to social protection where they direct their benefits just to just to the very poorest in their in their societies are very much the kind of 19th century model that we had in uh, Europe which we we left behind many many years ago but it's still promoted very strongly in in a lot of low and middle income countries or um, you know the debate of where the country should start building a sort of rights-based social security system the type of system that we find in in modern states and I think which the paper argues that countries can actually afford to do and that this kind of spending could be sustainable and both beneficial. I mean, this debate, I think, uh, internationally is uh, critical and important, uh, important. I mean, I think it's evident in the struggles that we see, you know, where governments that put in place universal benefits for their population often find themselves under attack by international in institutions. The, the sort of struggles that the government of Mongolia has had in trying to maintain the universality of its child benefit system, despite international institutions threatening them to, to target the program, or country like Kyrgyzstan, which wanted to provide universal child benefits, but was told it couldn't by international institutions. You know, a country like Namibia, where we've had where a tremendous success in its universal old age pension and, uh, and uh, disability benefit system, but where international institutions are telling them they should target those programs, despite the fact that they're critically important in promoting inequal, uh, greater equalities and reducing poverty in, the, in those countries. I think the paper shows important evidence on the sort of high errors that we do find with a, with a poor relief approach that targets uh, people living in poverty. The fact that the, often with this approach, the vast majority of, of people living in poverty are excluded from social protection. Therefore, this kind of design it does not promote the kind of inclusion, social inclusion that we'd like to see. I think for those who don't know, I think I'd recommend see, looking at um, you know, evidence that's come out recently actually from World Bank research in the Philippines, which is showing you know, where a conditional cash transfer program there, which is targeted at the 20% at the poorest of the, the Philippines population, has actually led to an increase in stunting of 11 percentage points amongst non-beneficiaries. As a result of um, the slight increases in, in the cost of, uh, of, um, of high protein foods um, and the fact that then the non-beneficiaries who are just as poor as the beneficiaries have not been able to, uh, to, to, to um, buy, purchase the, the, those foods and have then have, have, have bought more rice and that has had a negative impact on their, on their children. Or the fact that interesting from work from um, you know, that we've seen independent research in Ethiopia, where the uh, Productive Safety Net Program, a, a workfare program, has been shown to actually increase poverty amongst ben beneficiaries. Um, I think recommend that people read this evidence to see that these programs not only not, don't promote inclusion, but can actually harm people. Um, I think it challenges, as Marta was saying, the, you know, whether the value of, of, of putting conditions in place on programs, whether there is any value. I think we need to stress that when we talk about conditions, we're talking about sanctions, we're talking about punishment uh, of, of, of people. There's you know, evidence in the United Kingdom of conditions and sanctions being put in place uh, in the last few years, increasingly um, through the, the British government, which have caused significant harm to the recipients of, of, of social 
protection, including mental illness and, and occasional suicides because of the punishment that people have received for not complying with the, with the, um, with the conditions. I think if I was to take, um, I think one 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 critique of the of, of the report, which I think I like to talk to the the, the rest of my my uh, the time I have, and I think it's only a small critique because I think the the report is trying to move in this direction. I think it's really about how we conceptualise social protection as a means of ensuring that we promote greater inclusion of everybody within the social protection system. I think it's important to remember that. Um, you know, that, that almost everyone in low and middle income countries would benefit from access to social security. The vast majority of people are living on low incomes in, in, in these countries. The vast majority are on less than $5 uh, per day or, or, or have consumption of less than $5 per day in purchase and power parity terms. Now that's very little because this is about the standard of living that you might have in the United States and the food poverty line in the United States is $5 a day. And many would argue that that should be regarded as the food poverty line uh, internationally. And this is what the majority of people are, are, are living on. So trying to target a group that is regarded as poor is difficult when the vast majority of people are in need of social protection in low and middle income countries and indeed in many high income countries. And I think, you know, the, one of the challenges that we face, and I think this is for to me is that social protection we often it's often talked about as you know uh, as for the poor and vulnerable but and you know and uh, i think in, in ter the the report itself used the, the the term disadvantaged groups so we have social protection but it's to help the poor and vulnerable these kind of groups of people that have been left behind um by society and with this kind of thinking it leads naturally often to trying to target those who are who are poor and vulnerable and I think we need to think how language frames our thinking when we're talking about the objectives of social protection. First, we need to remember, I think, that the poor, you know, this term, the poor, which actually for the people who work in international development, the poor are often seen as a great group that we're trying to help. For most people, they're not seen in, in, in that kind of way. The poor in English has two meanings. It means bad, as in bad quality. Um, and this can be translated into the, in so, you know, the way we view in many social protection systems and, and the design we, we sort of view the undeserving poor, those of working age who often seem to be lazy. And therefore, these people, we, we have conditional programs with sanctions or workfare that we find across many countries. Or the other meaning of the poor is, is vulnerable, as in you poor thing, you, know, you vulnerable thing. And these are the kind of seen, this sort of understanding is seen in the kind of poverty targeted benefits for those who we feel can't work, like poor older people or people with, uh, poor people with disabilities. And it's this kind of conceptualization that we have that frames our thinking. And therefore, social protection is often conceptualized as something for the other, because these poor people and these vulnerable people are not us. These are the other. And therefore, design and social protection systems, often of poor quality, for these others. Schemes that we would never design for, for, for ourselves. So we end up with these poor quality targeted schemes where the majority of, of those uh, um, you know, living in poverty miss out. These kind of schemes with lots of evidence, how they often generate conflicts and dissatisfaction, where communities can't understand why some people are, are, are getting the benefit and others can't. And you know, I think we often, in terms of language, many of these programs, you know, we talk about as social assistance, which really should be seen as a charity and it's not seen as a kind of a you know social assistance i think it's problematic when we refer to it as tax finance schemes and it was great to hear um marta talking about tax finance schemes and not social assistance because social assistance is charity and we need to be thinking about programs that could well be tax finance but also entitlements and i think this conceptualization of social protection for the poor and the vulnerable runs contrary very much to a rights approach because in the rights framework, everyone, and it's very clear, everyone has the right to social security. That means all of us. That means social security is not for the other, but it's for us, every citizen, and every other person who's, who, who's as, as Marta was pointing out, is within a country, including refugees who've managed to, to, to escape to a country, to escape harm in their own, own country. It's social protection that's for us, for when we may become vulnerable which is a very different thing about things for the other who are poor and vulnerable. It's about us, but whenever we become vulnerable, 
perhaps for when we have children and we need additional support for perhaps when we have a disability um which might happen to any of us uh, to, tomorrow it's when we lose our jobs and we're all in, un, unemployed it's when we reach old age and we need additional support these are programs that are for us not for the poor and vulnerable but for us when we become vulnerable i mean in my own experience brought up three children and i was really happy to receive child benefits for which i was paying for from my taxes but we were receiving those child benefits those child benefits made a big difference to 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 my to my children even though i didn't regard myself as poor and vulnerable um you know i want to look forward in a few years time to my old age pension i don't just want that to go to the poor and vulnerable that's a right for for me i have a disabled child and uh, it was really important to us to 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 receive disability benefits for our child which helped us to bring her up much better and the kind of broader social protection she got from the state was critically important for her development and integration within society but these are programs for us and the best way to ensure inclusion for for all of us in, in, into social protection clearly and the evidence strongly indicates that is through universal coverage providing programs uh, across the life cycle for everyone whenever we need it and this is why many countries do it this is why we find in more high income countries and increasingly in some middle income countries inclusive life cycle systems that ensure that every child or every person with a disability or those who are unemployed or people who've lost the breadwinner or when or people at old age receive the kind of benefits that they have and this is how we build modern successful social protection systems not so social protection systems that are that are just for those living in poverty as i said that's poor relief that was the model of the 19th century and it's unfortunate that it's been promoted so much around low and middle income countries rather than this kind of modern type of social protection inclusive system based on rights for everyone so i think if we want to generate more inclusion it's critical to move away from this understanding of social protection just for the poor and vulnerable social protection just for the other we need to move to this understanding of social protection for all of us when we all perhaps become vulnerable and put in place systems that are very easy to enter into um, you know where which means that very simple universal programs that are the best way in which we can access schemes when we need it and i think uh, marta was in, uh, importantly talking about many of the barriers that many people face when systems become too complex because we're trying actually just to design programs for the other we need to design simple systems to enable everybody to be able to access social protection and these systems will of course be much more popular and that's what we see around the world universal schemes are much more popular as a result of being much more popular, they generate much higher levels of investment. Governments are much more willing to spend it in them. As a result of that, the people living in poverty, those who are poor and vulnerable, in, in you know the, the, the target groups of others, actually receive much higher transfers. Um, and importantly, these programs are much more sustainable because they have political support, higher, um, more expensive, um, but more universal and inclusive schemes are much more likely to be supported supported by governments and that's why we see over time high income countries have grown to spend to invest around 12 percent of gdp on average in social protection and we need to see a similar commitment right across the world and through this kind of different approach by providing social protection for all of us in that way we're going to really address these issues of low of low coverage that we find worldwide and which marta alluded to and which is critically important to address particularly if we really are going to try and uh, achieve this, uh, the, the SDGs in every country in the world. So I'll stop there and, uh, let, uh, and get back to Simone. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for your pass passionate promotion of uh, universality, a universal approach to social protection and uh, an approach based on, on uh, human rights. And uh, I would really like to highlight your point about when we design implement try to reform uh, social protection policies and programs not to think about the other but to think about us how would we fit in such policy program uh, or reform that is obviously a, a key message that uh, we share and uh, I want to mention to both Marta and Stephen that uh, their presentations have, uh, have caused a lot of interest 
we have um, comments and uh, and questions for you. First, I'd like to um, share a comment. Share a comment by Isatu Chan. He says that uh, it is important for governments to create fiscal space for social protection as well. Uh, obviously, although uh, the issue of fiscal space has not been dealt in the, in the short presentation, whenever we think about social protection, we need to think at least about uh, three dimensions. One is coverage to be as uh, inclusive as possible. Uh, the quality and of the allowances, right? Uh, are we putting enough uh, resources uh, tr enough transfers or the, the right amounts to achieve what we want to achieve, so the, the, the quality of allowances and obviously the uh, financial sustainability of uh, whatever we're doing. And uh, uh, probably a good social protection system considers these three points uh, simultaneously. And uh, now I will now go to the first questions. Uh, first question I've received. Obviously, these questions are uh, to be addressed both by, by Marta and, and Stephen. I will go uh, now to the first question, which is um, from uh, Fidelis Youkoume, that goes to the issue of uh, conditional versus uh, unconditional transfers. And um, here it says, uh, well, Marta argued that uh, there is no evident, uh, conclusive evidence on conditional versus unconditional. Uh, but uh, does your study uh, compare the extent to which conditional cash transfer lead to, to human capital development compared to unconditional? Uh, is it evident that conditional uh, cash transfer can have a double effect by dealing with income poverty and at the same, same time contributing to human capital development? What do you think? So uh, please, Marta and Stephen, in that order, if you can uh, address briefly uh, this question. Um, thank you very much, Simone. I hope everyone can hear me. So, uh, in terms of conditions, um, um, they certainly promote human capital, but they also have a cost, right? A public cost. And so, the question should be is the additional cost of conditional tra transfers worth it? In other words, um, do they promote human capital more than unconditional cash transfers do? And here is we we have not done research ourselves, direct research for this report. We rely on empirical evidence that is out there. And we say that the evidence is very mixed. In some cases, some studies, depending on the methodology used, partly find that conditional cash transfer are, slight, are slightly superior in, uh, in terms of promoting um, education and health of children, especially in households. But in other cases, they are not. So given that our perspective is inclusion promoting inclusion conditional cash transfer as as uh, steven say and he'll probably say again uh, work as sanctions right they work to exclude they increase the risk of people being excluded from a program if for example they don't they don't meet the the conditions they don't they are not able to take the kids to school maybe because there are no schools in the area where they live or the schools are not good enough or they have no possibilities to taking the children to school so they work as a sanction and, the, and then therefore the risk of excluding people is larger where conditions are imposed um i'll let steven uh, give his own response as well please go ahead steve Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, conditional cash transfers, as I say, are, are a classic example of programs for the for the other, right? Because we would never design a social protection system that we were going to access. For those of us who are more powerful in society, that would include conditions and sanctions. So they're designing programs for the other, for the for the poor, the vulnerable, and often, as I said, the um, um, the uh, undeserving. Words they conceptualized. Now, I think, as Martha said, there is really no no evidence that the condition itself within a conditional cash transfer, you know, no robust evidence that this actually makes any positive impact. There are studies that show very slight impact sometimes. Other studies, for example, studies done um, in Morocco um, that showed that unconditional cash transfers had a greater impact um, on, on human development uh, than the conditional. Um, transfer. 
I think there's the, the real dangers we often see in many countries that children, particularly vulnerable children, are excluded. Children with, uh, children with disabilities are often excluded by conditional cash transfers because they're unable to access the, the school as easily and uh, we require additional support. And I think there's also the danger that we need to look at of conditional transfers with the sanctions um, creating harm. So there's a recent study showing by, by the World Bank again in the Philippines and the conditional cash transfer program there that's showing how it's promoting incre an increase in child labor because as the transfer values are quite low, um, Families are having to send the children out to gain additional income by working to be able to pay the school fees to, to remain in school so that they don't get sanctioned by the, um, uh, by, by, by the program, so they can rem remain on the program. And I think, you know, we have to remember there is a lot of evidence of, of many unconditional programs around the world having very, very positive impacts on child well-being, just as significant, including old age pensions where we know that grandmothers and grand grandfathers taking care for their kids are having just the same kind of impacts that any transfer, a conditional cash transfer is having in terms of child well-being, in terms of accessing uh, school. We have a lot of evidence. So I think, think it's a, more an ideological question, a conditional conditionality, much more than a practical question. Thank you, Stephen. As, um, as questions are uh, multiplying, I will now uh, read Martin and Stephen uh, two questions at a time. And um, the first one is from Amin Lamrabat. It's a broad, very broad question, which is, in your opinion, which type of social protection measures are the most effective? And um, the second question is uh, from Katarina Silveira, and it's about social dialogue. And she says, I was wondering if uh, you could further explore the role of social dialogue as a component in this equation when building strong social protection policies when building social protection policies i was wondering if you could further explore uh, the role of social dialogue as a component uh, when building st strong social protection policies uh, please marta go ahead yeah indeed very broad question um Maybe just to say that obviously the answer of which um, which social protection schemes are most effective is rather context specific, right? It depends on you know the specific situation of a country. We look at social protection schemes from again an inclusion perspective. So from our perspective, the most effective uh, social protection schemes are those that include the most people with the less cost. And in, it's, it's in this sense that we say that targeted schemes are not only su superior at reaching quote unquote disadvantaged social groups because they are the errors of exclusion. And by errors of exclusion, I mean the exclusion of people who should benefit from a social protection scheme are often larger when schemes are targeted. And they are not even cheaper than universal schemes because they have had the, their implementation has high administrative costs. Okay, from, so from an inclusion, merely a social inclusion perspective, universal schemes are at times more effective at reaching everyone than target, at times more effective at reaching everyone than targeted schemes. But again, this is a very, um, a very um, uh, context specific question. I, by the way, want to acknowledge that I'm not the, the sole author of the report on the world social situation, and I have uh, the other two co-authors of the report here next to me, and I want to ask them if they want to add anything to the, no? Okay, but the, I'll give them a chance to answer the more difficult question. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I'll let Steve answer the second part of the question. I'll let Steve answer the second question then. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll just go on the, first, on, the, on the first question for which type of social protection is is, is most effective. Well, I think it's um, social protection. We have to look at social protection systems where we have adequate levels of of, uh, of investment in schemes, as I said, that are across the life cycle. That is the most effective way, and I think that's the approach that's taken in the in the report, in that we address. We ensure that every child is able to access a benefit. Every person with disability can access a benefit. Every older person can access a, 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 an old age pension. Every person who's unemployed can access a program when they, when they need it. I think there's no sort of magic answer of one program is better than the other. 
we need to address that we we face these risks across our life cycle and the system has to address all of that and the the the, the point about having more inclusive schemes is that they are going to generate high levels of investment as i said before and therefore are going to be more effective and when we just have teams that are targeted the first as Marta was saying actually we often find that the um we usually find that the majority of people living in poverty are excluded for a, for a whole range of, uh, of, of reasons. So I don't think there's any sort of magic bullets of one type of, of social protection program. I think it's a, the right mix of social protection programs that are politically acceptable and have, and have political support. But I think in terms of the question on, on, on social dialogue, I mean, for me, I don't, I don't know, I mean, I'm probably not an expert in this area. I mean, I think that the main type of social dialogue in any democratic country is in an election. That's where the real social dialogue is, is made, uh, where different ideas are contested. And that's where we've seen actually the, the most dramatic expansions in social protection come about as a result of, uh, of political parties promising social protection in elections, winning the election and implementing it uh, you know, after they, 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 they've won the election. I think it's really important to, to, to see that we, we need to ensure that social protection is something that, uh, that, that politicians do present to the nation and have a broad national dialogue and social dialogue in the, in the election and let the citizens decide about which type of, of social policy more broadly they need and, uh, and, and then elect governments that will then deliver what the majority of citizens want. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think we do need to highlight the importance of elections in a, as, as the key area of social dialogue in any nation. Thank you, Stephen. Um, now I want to share another comment by Muhammad Aslam, uh, who says uh, social protection varies from place to place and is different in low and high income countries. And, uh, and, and thus we must consider uh, that the theories of social protection are connected with uh, uh, the econo economic and political and cultural factors. That connects to a, a question from Felipe Albuquerque who uh, goes back to the issue of conditional and unconditional. And uh, he jumps into the answer and he says, can we say that conditional cash, tra cash transfers in countries like Brazil, which is a developing country, may work more than in countries that are least uh, developed? Uh, access to education and health systems, for example, may be more possible in middle-income countries than in uh, least uh, developed uh, country. So maybe if Marta and Stephen uh, can discuss a bit this issue of uh, different stages of development and also going back to the question on uh, conditional cash transfers. So by definition, um, conditional cash transfers are successful if there are social services, uh, schools and hospitals and so on, accessible to everyone, accessible geographically, accessible um, in terms of income, right? So uh, by definition, if, if, um, if social services are not of sufficient quality or not accessible to people, conditional cash transfers cannot work. And so in poorer countries with less good social services, uh, conditional cash transfers will, will be less, um, less possible. But even in Brazil, um, it is not clear, again, I will go back to the same answer, right? It is not clear that even when social services are in place and accessible, that they are more successful at uh, promoting human capital um, than non-conditional cash transfers. You know, it's, it's assuming it, there's a, a paternalistic component to conditional cash transfers in the sense that it assumes that people will not do what's best for especially their children unless they are forced to do so. And that it's, it's, not, it's not clear that that is the case, right? There are constraints that people face when they live in poverty and these constraints prevent people from accessing, um, from accessing education or health, that's all. Um, Stephen? Yeah, uh, thanks, Marta. I think yeah, in terms of the sort of different type of social protection in low and middle in, and low and high income countries, I think what is interesting is that how, how remarkably similar some types of social protection systems are as they evolve. Most countries tend to evolve into the sort of life cycle 
type of social protection system. Clearly, when social protection was first introduced into Europe, it was more around these kind of poor relief programs for the very, very poor, and they evolved over time into inclusive life cycle uh, systems as countries became more democratic, and therefore uh, politicians were putting forward programs that would um, that would require to win elections. Um, um, but also because as as, as, as countries became uh, wealthier. And we see this in many low and middle income countries. We see many countries putting in place the same type of programs. I mean, the, there's a vast number of old age pension schemes across uh, low and middle income uh, countries, which is sort of following the model because most countries recognize we all face the same res risks as, uh, as, as human beings. And in fact, many programs that we find in low and middle income countries aren't naturally from that country themselves, but are, are, are adopted from sort of Washington-based institutions that are telling them what kind of system they need to put in place. So I don't think a conditional cash transfer in the middle of a country in Asia is necessarily a homegrown initiative. It's something that people have been, you know, they, they, it, there's been strong advocacy from institutions for them to, to, to um, prom pr promote those kind of, uh, those kind of schemes. Um, I think it's important to look at a country like Nepal, which is, you know, as, a, as a, one of the poorest countries in, in Asia, it now has a universal old age pension for everybody over 65, universal disability benefits, and is trying to build the child benefit system. And is a kind of a, a great example to the rest of the world of what countries can do. And of course, these programs are having very significant impacts in Nepal. In terms of you know, the conditional cash transfer question, uh, you know, and linked to Brazil, I mean, I think we have to first not buy into the myth of Bolsa Familia, okay? Bolsa Familia, uh, Bolsa, uh, you know, Bolsa Familia in Brazil is a very small program in the Brazilian context. It's not that effective compared to the main social security schemes in Brazil. Bolsa Familia, uh, the investment in Bolsa Familia is one twenty-fifth of the investment that Brazil puts into its old age pension system. And the old age pensions have much larger impacts on both poverty and equality and probably on child well-being in, in Brazil. So we have to sort of, you know, look at this kind of question. But I do think, the, you know, the, the question itself is, is, is important. A country like Brazil can probably manage a conditional cash transfer program. It has the administrative resources, the skills and, and the people to be able to do it. Many low-income countries, even though they adopt it because of the very weak administrative systems, cannot um, actually administer a conditional cash transfer program. So in Kenya, for example, twice they've been persuaded by international institutions to attempt to put in place a conditional cash transfer program, and both times it's failed because the administrative capacity isn't there for the program. So I think the question is quite right. In, in, in many countries, programs are too complex for, for, for them to be able to deliver, and it's really important to put in place much simpler schemes that, that the actually uh, fit with the administrative capacity of that country. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, now there is a, a question directed uh, to you uh, on sort of changing the mindset of, uh, of uh, policymakers. Uh, this question is from uh, Yusuf Hassan, who says, uh, Yusuf Hassan from uh, Nigeria, who says uh, the following. Middle and low-income countries do not practice universal social protection programs because one, fiscal space uh, does not exist, two, uh, targeting is the problem, three, understanding the benefit uh, uh, is uh, not allowing for political reasons is prevalent. So the question is, uh, given the following, excuse me, uh, cannot aid by donors be directed to education of policymakers in these countries? I mean, if they understand uh, the benefits of the universal social protection, why would they not uh, dedicate more effort? That is one question directed to uh, Stephen. And then uh, there is uh, another question, which I read again uh, and now because it's uh, on the topic of targeting versus uh, universal uh, social protection, that is um, the, uh, on the issue of uh, targeting versus universal and small versus larger benefits. 
the obvious answer is uh, this is from Barry Herman uh, is to raise taxes enough and to make a uh, cash transfers taxable income but uh, what to do when government uh, rules out raising more revenue so go ahead uh, first let's go to Stephen and then to Mark Thanks, Simone, and thanks for the, the the really great questions. I think uh, you know, I think one where we say that low and middle income countries or low income countries don't have universal social protection programs. Well, some do. Okay, and the the, the political will is there. I just mentioned the case of Nepal, one of the poorest countries in the world, that has invested 1.3 percent of GDP in its universal age pension. So we know that it's not a question of affordability. Countries can can, can do this. Um, and, and you know, we've done lots of work in many countries, and you know, it, it is perfectly feasible for countries over the period of 10 to 12 years to introduce a range of universal programs if the political will was there. Now, can aid be, work, be used to help change the minds of, of, of policymakers? I think absolutely, yes, uh, it can be. I mean, I think there is one problem. Aid is often used. Um, and, and, you know, to promote particular types of social protection. So many, most international donors actually promote poverty targeted programs, conditional cash transfers, which are used to influence governments to introduce those kind of programs um, and take loans for those kind of programs. So aid is being used to, to, to influence already, but often programs that are not really to the benefit of that, of that country and are programs that governments would never themselves invest money in. in. Because, they're not, they, because these are the programs for the poor. They're not for the majority of citizens. And governments are about um, programs for the majority. Um, programs that, in a, in a democratic context, will help them win the election. So they're not going to get behind many of these poverty targeted programs, which is why many of the donor supported programs stay very, very small. But I think on the other side, there are examples, I think, around the world of different international institutions also promoting and trying to, on a, to promote on a much more evidence based. To, to enable um, policymakers to see the pros and cons of different approaches, provide them with the international evidence on a on a more open and honest basis, so that they can make make for themselves their own decisions within their own context. And I think there's good examples. I think in uh, in Uganda, um, the uh, DFIDs been following a program where they've invested a lot in build in, in building um, awareness among social protection. If anybody goes to visit uh, Uganda and you go to see the members of the parliament in Uganda, you'll see that they are all fantastic um, advocates of social protection there and are pushing very, very hard for a universal pension in, in, in Uganda. And uh, it seems that we're almost at the point of getting an agreement from the Ministry of Finance to, to do that. I think uh, UNICEF and uh, WFP, I've worked with them in, um, in Kenya uh, as a result of the work in sort of building the understanding of government of different approaches to social protection, that resulted in the Kenyan government this year introducing a universal old age pension in, in Kenya. Something they hadn't thought of before, but they could do it. So you can use this kind of work, and I think there are good examples of, of it being done, but I think it's important that it's all done on the basis of, uh, of evidence, that, that policymakers themselves can see what is good and bad from different approaches, and then make their own choice. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll just finish there. Please, Marta. Sorry, um, I think I missed, there was a question for Stephen, and then the other question was about whether um, whether taxes, is raising taxes enough, right? And what to do? Okay, and what to do when governments don't want to raise taxes? Well, um, I think, we again, we are not experts on, on, uh, on, on on uh, social protection systems and how to fund them, but I would say that um, there are many ways to raise domestic um, revenues. Uh, for one, even without changing tax policies or the, the, the taxes in place, there's a lot that governments can do to make the administration of existing taxes more effective, right? To, uh, to make sure that the taxes in place are paid to, um, to address tax evasion and tax avoidance, for example, just to make the existing system more um, effective, uh, to make taxes more pro progressive in the sense that uh, people living in poverty would pay less or benefit more and people with, you know, with higher incomes would pay more to existing systems. And then um, 
Yes, I mean, and then obviously in some countries, yes, yes, domestic revenue coming from taxes mainly is not enough. And then here ODA uh, plays a role. As Stephen said, sometimes ODA is used to, uh, to fund targeted small schemes that are short in duration. Um, maybe they should be changed, but ODA can play a significant role in promoting universal social protection systems um, as well. I don't know if my co-authors want to say something because this is a chapter prepared by Jonathan uh, Moore. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Marta. Now I'm going to lump together uh, three questions because they are on, on the broad relationship between social protection and, and the SDGs and the other aspects related to it. The first is from Paul Gomba, who says uh, the role of social protection in alleviating poverty is undisputable. However, I wish to find out how can social protection be used to serve other developmental roles looking at issues of sustainability? So when, when you, Marta, for instance, said, let's go beyond poverty, let's look at inequality. And here the question is, well, what are those other uh, roles are, uh, for, for social protection? Then uh, there is a question uh, from Amin Lamrabat, which is, in your opinion, is social protection instrumental to achieving the SDGs? And then uh, there is a question uh, from uh, our dear friend uh, Wen Yang Yang, uh, if she, from this, I guess. <laughs> I think if, if, she's, if it's the same Wen Yang Yang I know. Given that access to social protection is an effective policy tool to address poverty and inequality challenges, what, in your respective view, uh, the countries at risk of not meeting SDGs SDG targets can do. Is social protection affordable for least developing, least developed countries? And what will you suggest to be done? So please go ahead, Marta. So on the very short answer on whether social protection is instrumental to achieving the SDGs, the answer is yes. And we have provided evidence. It's recognized in the agenda 2030 uh, in the first goal on poverty. And we have just summarized some of the existing evidence on how uh, social protection has, can have a positive effect on other goals as well, from gender equality to uh, promoting education, uh, healthcare, which is obviously part of social protection systems, and so on. I don't know if the second question was asking beyond these goals, uh, perhaps since it, it, you mentioned sustainability, perhaps it had to do with environmental sustainability. And uh, I know there are some examples, including in Brazil, of social protection systems that, again, improve conditions, and in this case, are conditions on, uh, uh, to promote sustainable production, agricultural production systems, and so on, and not depleting the environment. How effective they have been, maybe, Simona, you know more than us on that. Uh, I'm not sure. But certainly, there's potential. I mean, as the, you know, Agenda 2030, the main uh, principle of Agenda 2030 is that all the goals and targets are interrelated and social protection systems are recognized as a tool. So certainly there's field for promoting most of the goals through so this one specific policy tool, which is social protection. Um, on the issue of affordability, I think, well, we, we talked a little bit, it's not, this is not the main purpose of our report. The ILO has done a lot of work showing that social protection systems are affordable they are not free, but they are affordable for most countries. Um, um, not for all countries, but they are affordable for most countries if, if the political will is there and there are ways to raise domestic revenue to, uh, to fund uh, comprehensive social protection systems. Um, yes. So that's, that's a very short answer to these very general and important questions. Thank you, Marta. Please, Stephen. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the, the, the question about whether social protection can support other uh, developmental sort of uh, aims, etc. I mean, I think you have to recognize that uh, in a market economy, any successful and sustainable market economy requires um, adequate investment in, in social protection, because that is going to have a whole range of, uh, uh, of different benefits right across different, different areas of, of development. One, just the very simple thing about... Uh, you know, it's really important just to, to generate great demand and consumption in, in society by giving people cash to spend. That itself will just generate more 
economic growth, which will generate more taxation, which will then ultimately allow governments to invest more in, in a wide range of, of services. But there's a lot of evidence, and I think if you read the report, you can see about the, you know, that uh, the, the, the broader impacts in education, health, etc., um, are, are, are there because you know, educate, just investing in education and health isn't isn't enough, or in, in many other areas. So I think it's, it's critical, and this is why social investing in social protection is is in most high-income countries the highest area, the, the largest area of government investment. And I think we need to recognize that and take the lessons from that because it is critically important across a whole range of areas. You know, high-income you know, countries and their governments wouldn't invest in this area if they didn't really recognize the absolutely essential value of it. Now, is it affordable? Um, yeah, I think it is. I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised if any country couldn't afford to invest in a comprehensive social protection uh, system if the political will is there. I think it goes back to the question of taxation. Are governments willing to tax sufficiently to be able to invest in, in social protection? As Mardo mentioned, the, the ILO have done uh, a, a number of bits of work to show areas of potential um, fiscal space. But I think one area that's often forgotten about is just economic growth itself. That can bring significant fiscal space. If a country's economy is growing at a much faster rate than its population, it's going to generate more, more new tax every year, year on year. And if governments plan, um, say, over a period of 10 or 12 years, to gradually take a small proportion of that great that, that increased tax and invest it in social protection, it becomes quite affordable. So we did, we've done some studies in a number of countries um, looking at the potential fiscal space that comes from economic growth. Just to give an example of Kenya, we looked at how could Kenya move to 2% of GDP investment in, a, in, a, in an extensive range of, a, of, a, a, of um, universal child benefits, old age pension, disability benefits. And we showed that um, over time, on very, very conservative assumptions, that uh, um, the, 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 the uh, government spending in other social areas would increase across all areas, um, but would be only very slightly reduced if they were to increase the spending up, up to 2% of GDP. I think the figures were different assumptions. It was, you know, across most areas, government could invest spending, could increase its spending in other so social areas, social sectors by around 6.9% a year. And by investing up to 2% by 2030, that growth would, would, would reduce to, to, to only 6 to 6.7% to a year in other areas. Because there's a lot of fiscal space if you have the economic growth that you can tap into. But again, it comes down to the question of political will. And that really is a question of affordability, is about policymakers having programs that, that they themselves believe in and which will generate benefits for them and policymakers want to be in power and they want to win elections. And that's why they promote um, you know, social protection more in a, in, in, uh, during elections. And that's where we've seen, as I said earlier, the biggest changes in, in levels of investment in social protection. Thank you, Stephen. If I may add on, on what uh, Marta and Stephen have mentioned on this broad issue, uh, it is important to keep highlighting that social protection, for instance, uh, obviously contributes to poverty reduction, but also the, the reduction of, of inequality. And uh, uh, what we observe, uh, at least in our recent report here at the ECLA, titled The Inefficiency of Inequality, is that more egalitarian countries are, are also more productive because they're making use of all the human capacities uh, within their countries. So there is a strong relationship also between building a welfare state and being more productive. And indeed, uh, we need to look at social protection not as a, a, just a small area for the poor, but rather as building this welfare state, which is not a luxury only for rich countries. If we think of very rich countries uh, that now have a strong welfare state, say, as Norway, they didn't start building universal social protection once they were rich. They actually started building it when they were poor. That's why I think it is important for every country in the world uh, to go uh, towards uh, this path. And now I uh, am going to read uh, some more questions. We still have uh, about 10 minutes. And uh, 
we have a question from uh, Felipe Albuquerque. I will read two questions. One from Felipe Albuquerque, who thanks uh, you guys for the presentation and says, Marta mentioned the need to target specific groups within countries, creating tailored policies to overcome inequality and enhance social protection systems. But again, how can we do so? And at the same time, generalize this knowledge. In many cases, uh, experiences are not adaptable or suitable to other realities or countries. So this basically is a question on the transferability on knowledge uh, and uh, across countries. And uh, the other question I will share is from uh, Raquel Tebaldi. And uh, uh, she also thank you for the very interesting webinar and says, when discussing universality, a lot of focus is placed on affordability. Another key area that needs to be addressed are implementation capacities, which involve not only program-specific staff, which typically present a lot of gaps in developing countries, but also overall social work quality, infrastructure to reach remote areas, and financial inclusion. In this sense, I would like to know a little more from the presenters, the recommendations in terms of addressing implementation capacity gaps and the importance of promoting quality social work. Please, Marta, go ahead. I'm going to let other um, the other authors of the report participate in the discussion. But in terms of targeting the transferability of, of lessons learned to other country realities, yeah, I mean, it, it's so the issue of targeting, again, is very country specific because the groups in need of special measure, if there are groups in need of special measure, vary by country, for example, right? Uh, targeting itself, itself is, is easier to implement in some administrative and in some institutional context than others. We in the report have, have um, shared lessons learned that I think are valid for any country context, which is that targeting is not administratively easy to implement. It's usually not administratively easy to implement unless the, uh, the principles for targeting are very straightforward and are aimed to exclude only the people who are better or well off only. Um, and that they, they are not, they may necessarily, they are not less costly in general than universal measures. This seems to us like a general lesson, but yes, it's true that there, there are country specificities and that it's hard to generalize. Having said this, this general response, I'm going to pass the floor to Maren to talk a little bit more, especially about the issues of implementation. Um, yeah, no, thank you for the question. I mean, in terms of implementation gaps, I think that the recommendations that would come from that um, are a lot of the things that we've already mentioned in the sense that um, in cases where countries have low administrative capacity, one of the best ways then to ensure the accessibility of social protection is to make it administratively simple. Um, so one of the ways in which this low capacity can be addressed then is to simplify the program so that um, there's not a lot of need for, um, for capacity in that sense. Um, and in that sense then um, you, can, you can make it more accessible. I mean, another thing too, in, in terms of financial inclusion is one of the points that we've said before, that we're not only looking at social protection systems, but then we're also looking at the other social policies um, and infrastructure that needs to be in place to finally promote inclusion. So financial inclusion then would be one case where um, where, you know, of course, social protection has an important impact, but that we need these other supporting systems in place within countries to make sure that they have the most impact um, possible. Okay, if, okay, great, Steve. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think in terms of the, the, you know, the, the question of, you know, targeting specific groups is, is really, really important. But I think it goes back to my point. If social protection is for everyone, we need to be put in place the basic social social security programs in any country that everybody can access. So, you know, if everybody, you know, uh, as, as, you're, as in Bolivia, um, there's a universal pension for everybody, well, then everybody, including indigenous people, including those from the small indigenous groups in, in lowland areas of, uh, of Bolivia should be able to access that old age pension. You eliminate the, the sort of discrimination around that. Um, you know, and I think it's often the more complex targeted 
programs that, that, that create much more exclusion of, of particular groups. So in Bangladesh, the indigenous groups in, in Bangladesh have very, very, where you have very highly targeted programs, have very low levels of access to social protection. They don't even hear about the, the existence of programs in, in Bangladesh. And there's some very interesting studies um, about that, in part because they're Christian and, the, and a lot of the information is passed through the mosques. So they don't even know how to, how, how to apply. I think there's you know, a lot of knowledge. I think it's important for countries to learn from each other. Um, in this, but I think uh, you know, the, the, there are the lessons. This comes back, I think, to the second question, and I think it's it's already Aaron has already um, alluded to. It. You know, by making programs as simple as possible, then administratively, then you'll be much better able to to implement them. But I think you know we even need to remember, even in challenging um, situations, if your program is simple, you can deliver it. Nepal started its universal pension. In 1997, with incredibly simple administrative procedures, with people, with government civil servants carrying money up and down mountains to be able to deliver that simple program to everybody in 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 Nepal. So it can be done. But there's a lot that can be done now with new technologies to make these systems much more effective, and also to build on the new technologies, as as we said, to to increase the financial inclusion if we can find transfer systems. Uh, uh, payment systems that enable to promote greater financial uh, inclusion. I think there's a lot of great initiatives at that level in terms of different operational uh, experiments that you can find in many countries that countries can go to learn from others to see how to deliver programs more effectively, um, you know, um, in their own in their own country. But I think you know, keep it simple the, is the main method. The more you put in the complexities of targeting, the more you put in complexities of conditions, the more likely you are to fail. Um, you know, I thought most governments want to, want, don't want to fail, so go for simplicity and go for something that's going to be popular. Thanks, Stephen. We have uh, three more minutes, so now uh, I will uh, read uh, the, the questions and comments that we haven't been able to attend, and then I will give you the floor for a one-minute closing uh, remark to both of you. Uh, one uh, message from Rita Luthra, she says that we at the Women's Health and Education Center latest focused on ending child marriage and uh, with the support of WHO, is, is this uh, helpful? Um, is it something that transcends uh, social uh, protection? Then we have um, issues of relationship between, uh, oh uh, yeah, a, a comment from Burkina Faso. Uh, M. Uh, Bukhari, who, uh, Oderaogo, who says, for a country like uh, Burkina Faso, we are in process of targeting to have a, and the, uh, of building a social register because we cannot do a universal program. So the issue of uh, scarce resources. Question um, uh, from uh, uh, Verena Damero, who says, uh, uh, I will like, uh, she would like to ask the presenter to expand on the financial sustainability, again, issues of financial sustainability of universal social protection schemes in developing countries, how to convince policymakers and finance ministers. And also a question from uh, Medhat Abul uh, uh, Zahab, what is the impact of GDP on social protection? And uh, finally, question from Rosa Kim, how can decisions around social protection programs that are inherently political arrive at societal consensus to be understood in a rights-based framework? What are the additive measures that need to be put in place? So I gather that uh, our uh, listeners and the participants in this webinar uh, basically share the importance of, of uh, universal social protection, but they are worried about the political and uh, financial dimension. Marta, Stephen, just closing remark. So obviously it's impossible to answer all the questions in one minute on the closing remarks, maybe picking on just a couple of them. Uh, on the, there was one on the, um, the relationship with GDP and then social protection expenditure and how, how uh, to finance uh, social protection systems and so on. Um, obviously, richer countries tend to invest more in absolute terms uh, in, in, in promoting so in in social protection systems in general. 
but there's a wide range of expenditure at a given level of GDP. You have countries investing very different amounts of money, very different percentages of GDP in social protection systems, which means that mostly how much you, you, you invest in the welfare state is mostly a political decision, right? For a long time, uh, too much social expenditure has been seen negatively, uh, including by the international community, right? Which has promoted uh, reducing ben um, deficits, reducing public deficits and so on. So I think with the Agenda 2030, we can change the international community's perspective on this and, um, and, 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 and promote inclusive and universal social protection systems and, and, and pass the message that of, uh, whether they are affordable or not, and how much countries spend is mostly a political decision. It's not an economic one. Um, having said that, I also want to thank the organizers, obviously, but also Simone and Stephen personally, Simone for, for uh, acting as an advisor and reviewing our report, and to Stephen especially for uh, his direct contributions to the report and for being our key advisor. We have learned a lot from you, Stephen. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Marta. I'll just I'll just finish. I think I'll just answer one question. I mean, I, I work in many countries in social protection. I hear exactly the same thing as our colleague, our friend there said from Burkina Faso. Well, but we can't afford a universal program, so we're going to have a private, we're going to have a social registry. I hear that all the time. Of course, you can afford a universal program in Burkina Faso. You're listening to the wrong people start doing some proper work to look at the fiscal space and look at the political centers that you can give to politicians who will understand the benefits of investing in a more universal program. You know, the same thing we, we heard in Kenya two years ago. We were told by international institutions, Kenya will never have a universal program, not for 15 years. The next year, it has a universal old age pension. Don't listen to all of this in the social registry, if you invest in that, I'm afraid you're going to fail because you're going to exclude the vast majority of people living in extreme poverty. I'd just like to finish to, uh, by thanking the, the organizers, Simone and Marta and the colleagues for, for, for this. And uh, again, just finish by highly recommending to, uh, to everybody listening that they get down and they, they read this re the report. I think they'll find it really interesting. And, and you never know, it might change your mind and the way that you think and you might actually support your country to put in place a comprehensive and effective social protection system. Fantastic. Uh, so on my, on my side also, thanking uh, the two great speakers. This was a very lively discussion. Thanking Marta and uh, the team who uh, was able to, to, to do this uh, report on the World Social Situation Report on Social Protection. I see Marin Jimenez uh, there and uh, obviously, Thanks to Stephen Kidd as well, and uh, to the whole uh, socialprotection.org uh, team, Karine, Mariana, and of, to all of you, uh, the attendees, I understand that uh, the materials from these webinars will be available on socialprotection.org. There is also an invitation to uh, answer a, a webinar survey if you can, and if you are not a member yet, to become a member and to uh, spread the voice. Thanks to all and uh, have a great day or night. Goodbye.